everyone, and welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Our show today features Matthew McKay, who is a clinical psychologist and a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. He co-founded Haight-Ashbury Psychological Services in San Francisco in 1979 and served as its clinical director for 25 years. Currently, he serves as the director of the Berkeley's Cognitive Behavior Therapy Clinic, and he has co-authored many books on professional and self-help psychology and has sold over 3 million copies. But today we're going to be speaking to Matthew McKay about his recent book that is out uh, just recently called Seeking Jordan. This is a pretty amazing book that he actually co-authored with his son. However, his son was murdered about six years ago. So this book kind of came to fruition with having communication with his son on the other side through automatic writing. So we know that you guys are going to love this show, and we'd like to welcome Matthew to our podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited just to have a little chat with you even about your background because I've learned that you're a psychologist and I am a mental health therapist and I have my own private practice. And when I was reading your book, I knew quite a bit about some of the techniques that you were referencing about EMDR therapy and I'm also trained in hypnotherapy as well. So um, the first couple of chapters just grabbed me right away because this is what I do for a living. And, you know, I was really excited to actually hear and learn a little bit more about how some of these therapies that we do use in clinical practice can kind of create some of the experiences that, that you've had in connecting with your son, Jordan. But before we kind of begin there, I would like you to just introduce to our audience what it is that we're going to be talking about today and kind of give them um, a little heads up on what your new book, Seeking Jordan, is all about? Well, um, about seven and a half years ago, uh, my son Jordan uh, was shot to death on a street. He was uh, bicycling home uh, from work uh, uh, to the home where he lived with his girlfriend, and he was attacked and, and died on the street. And after his death, I just felt a tremendous need to somehow make contact with him, to reach him in, in a way that would assure me that at first he was still living in some form, still conscious, and that he was okay. And so I set out to do everything possible to try to find him, connect to him, hear from him. And when I was able to do that, uh, I wanted it to go further. I, it wasn't enough for me just to hear his voice, but I wanted to have a conversation. And so the quest continued for a way, a methodology, really, to be able to talk to him and, and have a two-way conversation to be able to ask questions and hear answers. And so the book really grew out of that. And the um, so the first part is simply just the quest to find him and to hear from him and to learn to speak to him. And the second part is really uh, what Jordan had to say about a lot of different things. Um, and you know, we can talk about that, but I mean, he really had a lot to say about uh, consciousness, about life between lives, you know, how, how the universe works. Uh, and so I ended up essentially transcribing, as he dictated, some of those experiences in his description of things that I had never imagined knowing. Yeah, and I have to say, I saw so many parallels of the experts in consciousness that we interviewed for our two documentaries, and the stuff that Jordan wrote and communicated through you through the book. So it's always nice to kind of see that validation and reread it. And some of the same information is, you know, coming up again over and over when we're speaking about consciousness and, you know, life after death and does it go on. Um, but maybe can we start a little bit in the beginning with some of your quests and trying to figure out how to make contact with him? I know I'd like to get into a little bit of the automatic writing, but I'd also like you to speak about your experience with working with, I don't know if I'll pronounce this name name right. Is it Alan Botkin? Yeah, Alan Botkin. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, the story of, of how I 
met Botkin is that I, before Jordan died, I'm, I'm as you said, a psychotherapist, and uh, I use, uh, I work a lot with people who have trauma, uh, particularly people who've had experiences of early abuse. And uh, I had learned a technique called EMDR, eye movement uh, desensitization and reprocessing, uh, that is actually a wonderful uh, and very effective way of helping people face trauma and overcome it. And, uh, and so I read Botkin's book, uh, it's called Induced After Death Communication. And it was fascinating because Botkin, who worked at the VA, was, um, he stumbled on this variant of EMDR. It's a, it was a small variation in the, in the uh, protocol for EMDR that he just did accidentally, really. Uh, and he was working with a vet who had, uh, had a lot of grief over uh, someone he loved very much who had died in Vietnam. And um, Botkin made this small error, really, uh, in, the, in the process. And the vet suddenly had this full-blown experience of hearing and seeing uh, this person, uh, who actually had been a little girl in Vietnam, and, and seeing and hearing from her. And, uh, and Botkin was kind of blown away. And so he ended up doing a study, and he, he did this, this variation of EMDR, this, this, this technique, uh, with uh, 83 vets who he did not warn or explain what was going to happen. He simply was treating them for trauma, for PTSD. Uh, they expected some help with their trauma, but they had no reason to expect anything else to happen. And in 81 out of the, these 83 cases, uh, these vets actually experienced direct communication from someone who had died that they were, traumatically, that they uh, felt great distress about. Uh, so it was extraordinary. And um, so I wanted to have that experience. So my wife, Judy, and I went uh, to Chicago, where Botkin is, and had and underwent this EMDR process. And for me, it was extraordinary, because uh, at the end of the process, I heard Jordan's voice. I heard it in, the, in a way I, you know, as if he was in the room. Uh, I heard exactly what he said. He had messages for Judy. Uh, and he was also saying the two things uh, that I needed to know. He was acknowledging that he was there, that he existed, that he cared, that he still loved us, that he was involved with us, but that he was okay and that he was happy in, in, in the state where he was. Wherever he was, he was happy there. So it was just this tremendous relief. I, I remember... Uh, leaving Chicago, uh, taking the train home, and just feeling this, almost this lightness that I had not felt since his death of, of, of oh, he's still with us. So it was, a, it was a very beautiful experience. Judy did not have the experience, but uh, there was some reassurance that at least one of us had heard him, and, uh, and he had messages for her. Yeah, pretty pretty amazing. Um, I also found too, you know, in in reading the book, that on the day that Jordan had passed away, that there were many of his friends and people that woke up that night and felt his presence in his room, in their rooms. Exactly. I mean, it was actually very eerie experiences where you know his boss, who was also a dear friend, and you know, beautiful eulogy at his funeral, but this boss wakes up at ex the exact hour that Jordan died, because we know pretty much exactly when he died, and uh, and feels this sense of, of grief, this disturbance in the universe, and, he, and it feels like something is terribly wrong, and he has this immediate sense of Jordan, but he doesn't know what it is, he doesn't know why it is, he, and so that was the, the first message that that arrived uh, the next night. Uh, Jordan's best friend uh, uh, woke up uh, in the middle of the night as if there was an earthquake and uh, had literally feeling like the bed was shaking and 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 feeling like he was falling out of bed and had immediately this sense of Jordan in the room and his presence and his uh, love and goodwill uh, toward him. And that was a very powerful. And, and then there were just a whole succeeding group of 
of messages. And, and one of the things I think it's important for people to know um, is that very often the, the, the people who are most, have, uh, most deeply experiencing the loss don't get messages right away. Uh, that the loss really gets in the way. It really blocks the channel of, of communication from the other side. Uh, and so, and so that, but that isn't something to be discouraged about. I mean, that's, that's just the nature of grief, that grief does uh, make it hard for us to hear the loved one uh, from the other side of the curtain. And so uh, Judy and I, for a while, really weren't hearing or experiencing anything. And we were getting various messages from, you know, his siblings, his, uh, his dear friends and, uh, and friends of ours. And they were all getting messages from it. And so I guess one of the things I want to do is I really encourage people to keep a kind of a log of those experiences. If you lose someone and you're not hearing directly, uh, there are people who are hearing. And to, and to be encouraging them to notice and appreciate and, and be aware when, when some message comes through. Because certainly we, we did get a lot of them and eventually started getting some more directly ourselves. Yeah, I think that's so important for people to hear because I I know just with people that I've come across that have experienced loss, sometimes they'll feel so frustrated that, you know, why won't my mom come to me in my dreams or why can't I hear them or see them or why aren't I getting signs? Um, so I think that it's just important whether or not if the person individually is getting a sign, but like you said, to hear those stories and to also get messages from others just as important. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, can you explain to our listeners how you, I guess, channeled Jordan through automatic writing? Automatic writing might be a very new um, phrase for some people, and some people may have never heard of it, and some people might actually be doing it themselves. Cause, so can you educate our audience on that? Well, automatic, or, or sometimes it's called channeled writing, uh, is actually surprisingly simple in, in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it, it doesn't really take much to create an emotional uh, and, and kind of spiritual environment for it to take place. Um, at some point uh, after Jordan's death, I uh, consulted a, a psychologist named Ralph Metzner, who really specializes in working with issues around the afterlife. Um, he does past life and between life regressions. He does um, he, he himself lost his son and eventually learned to make contact with him. And so he taught me how to do channel writing. Uh, and the process was that, first of all, I had to find an environment that I could use consistently that felt safe, that, that connected me in some way to um, a, a sense of being grounded and um, sort of solid inside myself. And, so I used a desk that was my childhood desk, and you know it was you know, part of part of my life, uh, all my life. Uh, and so that I chose that as the environment that I would use. Uh, you also need a, a focusing agent of some kind. So I had a candle that was uh, that my daughter had given me as a, a, a blue a glass mask that she'd actually gotten in Mexico. Beautiful object, but but the candle behind it has a kind of a flickering uh, blue light. Uh, you also need an object that connects you to the person you love that you want to speak to. And in Jordan's case, uh, I selected something that was sort of odd. It was actually a business card that he'd had printed up uh, that you know said uh, Jordan McKay, CEO, Omega Technologies. And he would use that in high school to get into technology conventions and uh, go, go see the latest stuff that was going down, going on down in Silicon Valley. Um, and it was really, there was no such thing as Omega Technologies, but it was his, his way of getting in to see a, a lot of interesting uh, tech shows. And um, so that card sort of reminds me of his humor and his audacity. Uh, and so I use that uh, as the object to connect to him. Then you have to get into a, an emotional and spiritual space of receptivity. And to do that, I just do simple uh, mindful meditation. I, I, I count my breaths. I observe the breath in my body. If a thought shows up, I, I simply notice there's a thought and ret return my attention to my breath. 
And I do that until I feel a sense of calmness, until my mind quiets, and until I, I feel open. And that, that, I mean, that's a subjective sense, but it, it, but it kind of is essentially the same feeling as being quiet and, uh, and feeling a degree of spiritual calm. And then I think openness happens sort of naturally in, in the course of that. Um, once there's a degree of openness, I have a little a notebook in front of me. Uh, I may have written the question I have for Jordan before I started the meditation, or I may write it after uh, I've gotten into that receptive place. But in any event, I physically write out the question that I have for him. And then I wait for an answer. And usually the way it works uh, for me, and I, and I think this is sometimes helpful to just kind of follow this protocol, is just kind of wait for a word to show up in my mind. Just wait and allow my mind to be as empty as possible and as open as possible. And I wait for the first word. When the first word occurs and I write it down, usually it, it begins at least a sentence or phrase that, uh, that comes next. Um, once that first sentence is is down, it seems to kind of open the door completely and I begin to get the next sentence or the next, and oftentimes it's coming so quickly that I have a hard time writing to keep up with it. And in some cases coming not as words or as sentences, but as just a complete thought with, you know, even sometimes very complicated thought that I have to then find language to describe. But th that sense of openness and waiting for the first word, allowing whatever that word is to, to show up, and then the sentence or phrase that comes from it seems to really get it started. Um, and, and I think there has to be, you have to allow the doubt to be there because, of course, you, you're going to inevitably have a degree of doubt that, um, you know, could this be true? Could you be possibly making this up? Um, is this really, you know, a communication from that person you love. Uh, and so don't fight the doubt, I would say. Um, it's going to be just there as part of the experience, waxes and wanes. But once you kind of get into the middle of the communication, you begin to feel this, um, a sense of uh, a, a rhythm to it. And um, and you get, a, you get this answer, whatever it is, you ask a, write down another question, and a new answer uh, emerges for that. Um, and the process begins to have a life of its own. And as you, as you uh, notice the answers you're getting, very often it feels like, for me, that I can feel Jordan's character and his quality of, of how he looks at the world and how... Uh, and his values and even his humor showing up in the answer. And it feels like this is not me. It feels like this, is, this really is coming uh, from another consciousness, a different consciousness than my own. So it's a very lovely experience. And I, and I get, you know, I can just keep asking questions and I can get answers. And Jordan seems very willing to stay with me as long as I have the energy to, to keep asking and keep listening. Uh, and and it, one of the things also, if I may say that that's nice about it, is you can ask things about, you know, how things work. What, you know, why are we here? What's going on? You know, what's what's the afterlife like? Or you can ask advice. I ask Jordan advice a lot about what you know things in my own life, and you know, what what, what would he recommend? Uh, and um, and also ask him about you know his current incarnation because he's back again. He's a little girl. Uh, and, uh, and another life. And I, sometimes I'm curious about what that world and life is like as well. And I get to learn a little bit about that. So it really is a very, uh, there's a lot, there's depth and, and, and engagement. Yeah. And I mean, the questions that you asked him and the responses that you got and all of the information that's in your book is, it's pretty heavy stuff. You know, so many people are looking to find these answers. And then, you know, it's like, here you have some great stuff that's been channeled through that, you know, just reminds me of so many things that I've also read in other places, just described in a very different way, you know. Um, 
And I mean, there's so many different avenues to go. I have so many questions. I want to try to fit it all in in the next half hour that we have. But can you maybe start us off with the whole thing and the explanation and how Jordan explained what the lives between lives were? Well, the, the life between lives has actually the same purpose as the life incarnate on you know whatever planets we we live on um, it's all about learning and the life between lives uh, in part has to do with reviewing each incarnation and and the and the akashic record and, and and you know what happened in that life each little decision we made and learning as much as possible from from each of those decisions and and so early on in the life between lives you know after you've landed and kind of uh, gotten readjusted to a life in which there's just energy as opposed to matter. Uh, even though at the beginning, when you land, you you often land in an environment that looks like matter. It looks like familiar places. You could land in a garden or in some some environment that feels familiar and comforting, uh, but it's all made of energy. It's 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 not uh, actually atoms and molecules. Um, but once we've kind of adjusted to that, and, we're, and we've begun to, we, we've we've seen some some people that we love, and we uh, begin to feel like a, a sense of oh yes, I'm back home. I'm 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 here in in, the, in that in the in that world uh, uh, in that afterlife world. Um, pretty soon after that, we go through a very comprehensive life review, and this is a little different than you know what we. Are sometimes familiar with in terms of uh, near-death experiences, where people explain this. Oh my God, I had this, you know, in the space of a few seconds, I, I saw all of these events in my life. The life review that occurs in the in the life between lives is actually very, very has a tremendous depth to it, because we literally go through every relative, small event of our lives, particularly the choices that we made, the things where we had some degree of choice as to how we responded. And we experience this in a 360. In other words, we not only experience it, that choice as, as it impacted us, but how it impacted every single person in our environment. And we can feel it and, and empathically get what their, what, how, how they were touched and, and, uh, and impacted by what we chose. Not only that, but we're also aware at the same time as how that decision impacted us and others over time. So we're getting this amazing uh, degree of, of clarity uh, about this one moment in time, this one event, and how it affects others and affects them over the course of days or months or years. So it's, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary. And then this just keeps going, one event after another, one choice after another, reviewing our entire life history not only as we experienced it and felt it, but as everyone around us experienced it and felt it. And so it's, it's quite de a bit of depth. And, and of course, depending on the kind of life you've lived, uh, I mean, let me, let me see. I mean, there's no evidence, by the way, that there's anything called hell. There's no afterlife experience. There are no bardos in the afterlife where people suffer or are made to pay back for their sins. As far as I can understand from Jordan, that just doesn't exist. And so there's not, a, there's not this idea of kind of the Christian idea of the sort of lives are past fail, that we either, you know, we're righteous and, and get reward in heaven or we, we're sinners and, and we go to hell. It just doesn't exist. But what does happen in this life review, and the closest thing that, that we get to hell in the, in the life between lives, is really having to face the impact of what we did. And if we've if we've made some very um, impactful decisions that really were damaging or hurtful to others, we get to experience that in, at great depth. Uh, and so that that becomes, you know, the, the, these first early steps of, of of learning that occurs in the in the in the afterlife, doing that complete life review. Um, after that, typically, from my understanding. From Jordan is we are reunited with our soul group, with this little community of souls that we uh, reincarnate with. And, and the way he explains it to me is, um, 
is soul groups are just kind of like, if you think of souls living in, just like we do on, on earth in, 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 on streets and blocks and neighborhoods and, uh, and cities and, and larger and larger communities and so forth. Soul groups are, a soul group is sort of like a bunch of souls that live in one house. They're, they're all, they're a family. They live in one house and they live life after life with each other, reincarnating in different relationships. Sometimes they're mother and father. Sometimes they're, uh, I mean, sometimes they're, they're partners. Sometimes they're parent and child. Sometimes they're uh, dear friends. So, you know, so, sometimes they're antagonists in, 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 uh, their lives, but the soul group is is a little repertory company uh, that keeps showing up in these plays, these life plays uh, over over many lifetimes and many many centuries. But also, if there are neighborhoods, so there there's the next door house, and then there's the one down the street, and there's and there's a neighbor uh, uh, a mile away, and and that just as we have in in our own lives, sometimes we we have soul friends who we reincarnate with who are living in you know metaphorically in different cities different countries not not that there are different cities and countries in the afterlife but but at great distance from the little soul group uh, that we uh, reincarnate with so we join that group and and of course there's a lot of jubilation there's a lot of um, a beautiful sense of, of uh, re, rejoining and, and reconnecting. Um, I mean, one thing that Jordan does make clear, and this is not just what Jordan says, but this seems to be fairly consistent in the spiritual literature, is that we leave a part of our soul energy behind even when we reincarnate. So some of our soul energy remains with the soul group. We still have part of us that is in, in the afterlife. And part of our soul energy, of course, enters a body and, and goes through a, a life experience. Um, so that when we return to the afterlife, we, we rejoin the energy that we left there and we become whole for a while. Uh, so it's a beautiful experience and it's, um, and it's one that's a, a real sense of, of um, com- completion. And then, of yeah, course, that- go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to comment before you go further, but I found that very interesting about how souls never leave um, where they came from 100%, and I had never thought about that in, in that aspect, but that also makes sense where he goes on to explain, you know, maybe our connection to God or just, you know, feeling that energy, and, you know, I've heard a couple of other people feel like that they were some people may explain that they feel like they're from another planet, literally, you know, and that they're, they're here and they're doing the work, but eventually they need to go home. So, um, I just, I found that really fascinating. That, I think that part of it. That's very interesting what you said, because I think a lot of people, and I've, I've met a few of these folks actually feel very alien here. They feel like this is a strange place. They feel very alone. Yes. Uh, like they've, they've left their family. They've left, what's familiar and right and, and, and comfortable to them. And here they are in this, in this strange uh, environment and, um, and facing rigors that, that are somehow feel wrong to them. And I, and I think that happens. I think, I, I think one of the things that happens is there's a certain amount of leap through for some people. You know, when we, when we incarnate, we, uh, we, we, we're given uh, amnesia, and we're given amnesia for a reason. Because if we if we realize what you know that we're just here uh, to live this life as as a as something that we're, where we can learn and 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 grow from our experiences, but our real home is is we actually remember what it is, and we remember our past lives, and we remember kind of our you know where we are uh, in 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 our development as a soul. Uh, if that were the case, we wouldn't take this life seriously. And we wouldn't take losses seriously. Uh, it would all be very sanguine. Uh, and, and the pain of this life, which is so important for our learning, which is absolutely necessary. We come here for pain. We come here because this is a difficult place. And we've come here to learn how to love in the face of pain. Um, and that's not something we can learn in the afterlife. There is no pain in the afterlife. There are no tests or challenges in that way. And so this is a very necessary experience to come here. Um, and it is something um, that if we didn't, if we remembered where we come from and what, the, what all of uh, our past lives have been about, 
we wouldn't take it seriously enough to learn anything. And so that's kind of one of the important things that Jordan has really made clear to me, uh, is that that amnesia actually serves us in a certain way, or at least serves us to keep us serious about the play we're in, believing it enough, and believing the experiences enough uh, to, um, to wrestle with them and, and, and actually struggle and, and feel some of the pain that comes from the losses and the, and the struggles we have. Yeah, I also found in the book, too, where Jordan was talking about how sometimes certain souls will experience so much pain here, but it's also for their ability to learn more rapidly. Yeah. That's right. That some souls will choose very difficult lives. We do really get to choose our lives. We're given some choices, and and we and some souls will choose very difficult lives, um, in order to grow or learn some lessons that are necessary for them. Um, and and I mean that's the other thing is we show up here and we all have a lesson plan. I mean this, the the life we we we've been given and the life in some le- level we've chosen. Uh, has a lesson plan embedded in it, and that's what karma is. Uh, karma is nothing more than our lesson plan. And the lesson plan often goes across multiple lives. We don't learn the lesson in one life. We will have in, we'll encounter experiences in another life uh, that will help us uh, learn that lesson. Uh, for example, if, if in one life uh, a soul was very um, ungiving and unloving toward another soul who is struggling with physical illness. It's not, it's not at all out of the realm of possibility that in the next life that very soul is going to have to continue this lesson and, and be stuck in a body that's ill and, and, and has a good deal of pain and disability because that's a necessary lesson and, is, and, and the karma, not a, it's not as a payback, it's not a punishment, but, but the lesson has to be learned in some way. So we keep encountering things in our lives to help us learn those lessons. Many of the experiences that we face are really about that lesson plan. They're not just accidents. They're not uh, chaos. They are part of the lesson plan we came here with. Yeah, I also remember reading um, similar to this. I don't know if you asked the question, but it was brought up to Jordan, and Jordan had answered about, you know, is every lesson pre-planned? And it was described that the big stuff is set for us. Like, there really are some things that within this lesson plan are set and probably can't be avoided, but that we are given free will. And free will will sometimes allow different lessons to occur in this lifetime. That's that's right. Um, You know, you might be given a body that has a certain, um, again, a certain uh, d- disability or, or a certain uh, challenge. Uh, and that's, un- that's inescapable. That's just going to be what happens. Or you might, uh, you know, if you're born, uh, as Jordan points out, if you're born in, uh, in Germany in, in, in the late 30s, you're probably going to have to uh, inescapably uh, experience uh, the Nazi regime, the Second World War, uh, and, and a lot of uh, related ex- struggles, struggles. So there, there are certain things that are unavoidable. But on the other hand, there are all kinds of choices we make. And those choices, uh, are, 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 there are several things that come from those choices. Sometimes those choices l- remove us from places where, where certain lessons are going to be learned. Uh, and, and they take us into a whole different uh, chain of cause and effect. Uh, but for the most part, those choices are responses to lessons we're learning. And if, and if our response is, is, is growth, is, 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 is using wisdom to, 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 uh, and, and love to, to respond to the challenge, um, and then oftentimes we move on to another lesson. We're done with that, and, and we have we move on to other circumstances. So a lot of this is really, yes, a lot of it is determined to some extent. A lot of it uh, may change depending on f- free choices that we make. Yeah. Um, and another question I kind of want to jump back to a little bit is about the past lives that you were speaking of. And earlier you had mentioned that you knew Jordan was currently incarnated as a as a little girl. And you shared an experience through a past life regression where you actually saw that Jordan in one life was your wife. And that might be really confusing to people. Like, how do you know that he's a little girl now? And what do you mean Jordan was once your wife in a past life? Can you describe that? 
Well, it was confu- <laughs> it was confusing to me too because I remember <laughs> very vividly, uh, you know, observing uh, the past life, and you know, I, I, when I first landed, often when you go to a, a past life, you, you land at just a certain moment in time, and and you look at your feet and your body, and you just orient yourself to an environment. And, uh, and then you'll regress from there. You'll you'll go further into the past of that life. You'll 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 go back in time in that life. And at, at, so I went back in time. I started out as an old man, or I landed in that life as an old man. And, uh, I went back in time, and, and and I can see this little cottage I lived in. I can see, I can see my wife. I know her name suddenly in that life. And this is how information comes to you. You're 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 kind of watching the the scene. And then suddenly you know stuff. It's like, oh, I know her name. I kind of know her personality. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I can see my children in that life, uh, one of whom is, is a child of mine in this life, and my daughter in this life. But in that life, I'm... I'm and, and so uh, in the midst of the, the process of kind of observing all this, uh, Ralph Metzner, who was doing the regression with me, says, well, now, who, who is your wife in this life? And I knew it immediately. I mean, it was like... The words had not gone left his mouth, and I already knew who it was. I knew that 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 young woman, my wife in that life, whose name was Elizabeth, uh, was Jordan, and I couldn't say it. I, it felt so wrong and so odd and so kind of um, against expectation that I would know Jordan in, in that way, and yet it it arrived as a truth that was seemed absolutely. Uh, clear and and indisputable, at least in, in my subjective experience at that moment. Uh, and so it was interesting because, again, the, something I didn't expect, something that actually was kind of disturbing to me, turned out to be what, what in fact was the case. And that, I mean, I've done other past life regressions in which Jordan has had other roles. Like he was a, I was a, in a yeshiva, uh, you know, a Jewish learning academy or rabbis, People learn to be rabbis, and um, he was uh, uh, an older, uh, very wise rabbi, and I was a young mentee of his. And in that life, he died uh, relatively uh, early in, in, in my own life, and, and I tried to make contact with him in that life. And in another life uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, Dutch country, uh, I, I was female in that life, and he was... Uh, he was an unrequited love of mine in that life. Um, so it, we've had a number of experiences together, and, uh, and Jordan's led me to know that, that in actually a lot of our past lives together, he's left early. Uh, and I've had to, it, this has been a theme or a motif of our experiences together where I've had to deal with grief, and, I've, and sometimes I've dealt with it in ways that were wise and full of love, and in other times I've dealt with it very poorly, uh, just retreated and given up and uh, sort of collapsed emotionally, psychologically. So uh, it's been interesting to kind of look at sort of a, an arc of, of the story of our lives over time uh, and that there's things I've been learning and, and to some extent things he's been learning that we learn from each other in these plays that, in which we uh, have has specific roles and relationships. Yeah, and that actually leads in really nicely to the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which um, are the reasons why souls don't stay long. And there's kind of a beautiful list on page 85 of your book. Would you mind if I actually read that? Not at all. Okay. Um, Because I I think that this is really important, especially for people who maybe have experienced a loss of a child. And like you say, that that is one of the greatest losses and sometimes tragic deaths. And especially when people are just so young, I find that many people that are here are left with the question, like, why? How could this be possible? You know, what, why is God punishing us? And, you know, it can really mess a lot of people up. So I found a lot of the things here on this list to be very soothing, and I think that they will bring a lot of comfort to people. Um, So I'm just going to take a moment to read them. And this is actually, I I believe Jordan is the one that uh, was reciting this list. This is through your channeled writing. He says, "There's, there's lots of reasons souls don't stay long. For instance, they may choose to briefly accompany and support another soul who will have a longer life, teach a specific lesson to one or more souls, 
learn one specific lesson to complete a karmic process from another life, focus on developing a particular spiritual skill such as a discipline or compassion or independence in preparation for another life when it will be needed, to learn a particular lesson such as helplessness that only childhood circumstances could teach, experience a short re-entry into the physical plane though they now spend most of their time in spirit, they may choose to give the briefest moment of pure love that will change surrounding lives, stay only a short time as a way to cope with the reluctance to reincarnate. I thought that was really fascinating. And the last one is to have a brief excursion to Earth, though they usually incarnate on other planets or planes. Like, wow. <laughs> when I read that, I was just, whoa. It's pretty you know, intense. And, and, and it's true. If it, I mean, I just wrote it down as he told me and um but it also it kind of made sense in terms of some things that i learned about jordan learned from him that you know in a past life he had um i had the experience that he was actually a a, a bootlegger in in uh, uh i guess the roaring 20s and um and in that life um had had some exposure to violence um and and really uh, struggled with with completing things with uh, w with willpower um, and and so in the, in this life the life he did not expect to stay long um, oddly enough he as a little boy he had a phobia of the police and uh, I, oddly enough I actually it makes sense that he would have a phobia of the police and um, but also that he was working on certain things in this life he was working on willpower he was working on the ability to to set his mind to something and 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 forge toward it um, and so he was he was working on his lesson plan here even though it was not going to be a long life but he had completed a lot of that he he really did Developed tremendous willpower, uh, and he, he accomplished a lot in a short life. Um, and so, it, the, some of the things that he listed seemed like they made sense because they really pertain to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know what? What would you say is the most important message, maybe for other parents? to hear who have lost a child or have lost somebody that was really young or maybe it wasn't quote unquote their time to die well isn't I mean they're just I mean they've experienced I've experienced that there's no getting around the, the sense of unbelievable loss that you will never hold and that child again that you will never I mean I I miss so deeply not to be not being able to hug Jordan and and have, have his physical presence uh, and and so there's that grief is is just not something we can fix. On the other hand, the knowing that. The circle is never broken. That that soul, that child, remains not only conscious, but remains full of love for us, remains involved. Jordan knows everything that's going on in our lives. And when he uh, communicates to people in various ways, sometimes he'll communicate with family members through mediums and sometimes, and, and uh, you know, amazing uh, in, ex, interesting experiences where people will go to a medium and and Jordan will just simply say, "Oh, I saw you do this, and I saw you do that, and, I, and you've been up to it." And so he's completely so th th that soul that we seem to have lost is still with us, is still very conscious of us, still full of love for us, and still able to listen to us. And all you have to do is send a message. You know, the, the souls that we think we've lost are just a thought away. All we have to do is think of them, and they are present. They are with us. So send messages to them. They are listening. They are getting those messages. And if we learn a little bit of receptivity, we can actually get messages back. So the circle is never broken. 
that soul is still with us, uh, that love is still with us, and, and the love we feel for that soul, when we experience that love, it is sent and directed to the soul. The soul experiences our love for them. Um, and so the relationship is not lost. That's the most important thing to know. We are still in it together. And that this thin curtain between life and death is, is more illusion than fact. It simply means we can't see the physical person. But we can still love. We can still talk. We can still listen and speak to that loved one. Um, that they are not lost, they are with us. Th those, those are the things that are the core, I think, of what Jordan has told me and what I would hope that someone else could take with them from my story with him, my experience with him. Yeah. Now, how has this changed you just from a clinical perspective and kind of maybe your approach to working with people who were experiencing grief? You know, I know that you said that you worked with a lot of people in trauma and kind of looking back maybe before this experience happened and how you worked with people as a psychologist and then where you are now and all that you've learned and evolved to become of who you are today. Um, you know, do you look at this differently and do you approach and work with people differently now that you have an understanding of this? Yeah, I do approach it differently. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I do carry my experiences into my work. I mean, I, you know, I can experience Jordan showing up in the room with me sometimes to help me with people. Sometimes I'll ask Jordan, what do I do, <laughs> what do, I do right now? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm stumped. You know, how do I, how, what do I say to, to this poor soul that, I'm, that is in so much pain? And I often get very helpful responses from him. But uh, I, I do bring in my cosmology, if we can call it that. I'll, I, I will talk about what I consider the, the, the deepest truth that the that soul that they've lost is not lost, is not gone. I will teach people to do automatic writing or channel writing. Um, I teach them to try to stay in contact with the person they lost. Um, so that's that's one direction I go. Um, I, and I will, I will encourage people uh, to, to use mediums and so forth to, to try to uh, have uh, at least a, a beginning experience, if they don't yet know how to make contact themselves, have a beginning experience of hearing from their loved one. Um, but I also take a different approach. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, you know, since, since I think we're, we, we come here um, for one purpose, which is to learn, and everything that we learn, uh, we bring back with us to the life between lives and upload to, to collective consciousness to all, to, to the divine, whatever we want to call the, the, the collective consciousness of all of us joining together. Uh, since that's our job, uh, I'm very interested in asking people, uh, given what's happened to them, given what they've lost, what, what is there learning in this? Is there something that they can use? Not, not that this was inflicted on them to, uh, as punishment, but is there something that they can t learn from this experience? Does it tell them something about their life purpose right now? What is their life purpose in the face of this experience? Does this change them? And sometimes it changes the vector and the direction that a person is going in their life. And it changes what's meaningful. What was meaningful before the loss may not, you know, mean a damn thing after the loss. And you and you have to go you have to go back and find out, well, what 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 matters now? Uh, what am I here to do now? Um, and so often the questions, the answers to those questions are different after we've lost someone who's, you know, so central, so deeply loved. And um, so those are, the, those are the issues. One is to, you know, really try to hold on to that person, hold on to the love, hold on to the connection. And the other is what is, what is my life purpose now? What am I here to do? What is there learning that I can take? from this experience that will help me keep going with my life purpose and do what matters now. 
Yeah. And I know towards the end of the book, Jordan was kind of saying, hey, dad, you got to blend this with science, too. <laughs> and he kind of wanted wanted you to bridge that gap a little bit. Yeah. And he really sort of chided me. And, and, and it was interesting. You know, I, I, you know, he outlined the whole book except the last chapter. And then he said, well, you know, you're going to have to actually go somewhere for this last chapter. You, you can't get this information from channel writing. And I realized later why he said that, because it would never, my channel writing with him is really, I'm asking questions and he's answering them. And it would never have occurred to me in a million years to ask questions about how to merge science and spirituality. I would never, it just was not on my radar. And so I had to, so he, he sent me to someone who could could get this across to me. And um, so I, you know, the last chapter does talk about that because I am, uh, you know, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a researcher. I, I really believe in evidence-based therapies and um, I believe in trying to use research and science to find out what works to help people. And I've done quite a bit of that research myself. And, and so I was really, you know, leaving these two worlds completely <laughs> separated. And, uh, and he's saying, no, no, you can put this together. And, and here are some ways to begin doing that. And in fact, he's now working with me to develop a, a protocol for helping people deepen their spirituality. Uh, and and uh, protocol meaning a, a series of actually therapeutic steps that people can take. So we've been working on that and we'll probably start experimenting with that and try and see if it works um, in the fall. So yeah, That's I, great. he's helped me uh, heal that, that gap a little bit uh, in my life. Yeah, I like how he teased you a little bit. And, you know, he was kind of saying, you know, consider how the impact of his death happened on your own life and, you know, and how how you've kind of grown just through learning how to talk with him, your fear of death reduce, reduce the clarity of your life purpose and well-being. And he's kind of saying, look at how you transform. There's data there. There's information. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that we could actually, you know, I, I, exactly, we, that we can learn how to use science to evaluate experiences like that. Uh, you know, channeled writing has an impact on people. Uh, certainly has had an impact on me. We could actually, you know, I mean, this is just a, for instance, but, you know, we could do a, 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 some research teaching people channel writing who are struggling with grief and, and do pre and post evaluations of their well-being, uh, their, their level of contentment, their um, uh, sense of, of purpose, their level of depression. I mean, we could, we could look at all kinds of things pre and post uh, after teaching people to make contact with those on the other side. I mean, that's an example. Now, it's, it's not a hard science in the sense that, you know, we're not measuring, uh, you know, some kind of phenomenon in, in, in space uh, or, the, or the exact distance from here to the sun. or anything. We're not, But we're talking about actually seeing if there's a method that can help people uh, feel better in their lives and there's a lot of research I do is really about that is you know researching therapeutic processes and seeing if people feel better and, and are emotionally healthier as a result so yeah there's there's a chance to really bring these things together Wonderful. Well, I'm so glad that we had you on our show. And now this book, Seeking Jordan, just recently came out. Is that right? Is it available for people to buy now? Yeah, it came out uh, beginning of March. Okay. And uh, why don't you let people know where they can find it and direct them to your website? Well, uh, the, the book is available Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, pretty much the bookstores and outlets that... Uh, are familiar to people. Um, it is. Um, it, it is. I mean, if you want to learn more about the book or more about some of my experiences with Jordan and some more of the channel writing, uh, SeekingJordan.com is a website that, that uh, you can uh, learn more about this. 
Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you, April. Thanks so much. If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at vimeo.com, guyamtv.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at the past series. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show.